So it's 2003, and Greg Daniels of Saturday Night Live, The Simpsons, and King of the Hill fame was sitting on his couch. His agent sent him a tape with some British comedy Daniels had never heard of. And then, poof. Daniels was inspired. NBC was cautiously compelled to create a localized version of BBC's mega-hit comedy, The Office. Compelled because of... $83. Still, a lot of money. Well, probably more than that. And cautious because there's been a checkered past of Americans attempting to redo British works. Gervais and Merchant, the creators of the original version, met with Daniels and they hit it off right away, as they were fans of The Simpsons. And they spoke to Daniels about an episode that he himself wrote, in which Homer unintentionally finds himself in a sexual harassment situation. And it just seemed like an office-type situation. The studio greenlit the creation of a pilot episode to see what Daniels, his assembled staff of writers, and a group of relatively unknown actors, and the much-beloved source material could produce. It's probably not a surprise to anybody watching this video that The Office US had a rocky start to say the least. Famously coming up for cancellation considerations had it not been for the sheer foresight and willpower of a handful of NBC executives, the dedication from everyone involved in the series, and Carell's appearance in The 40-Year-Old Virgin. No! Kelly Clarkson! And what The Office became was incredible. People say I am the best boss. They go, God, we've never worked in a place like this before. You're hilarious. I declare bankruptcy! No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 Would I rather be feared or loved? Um, easy, both. I want people to be afraid of how much they love me. Bears eats Battlestar Galactica. That's what she said. <laughs> the worst thing about prison was the was the Dementors. They were flying all over the place and they were scary and then they come down and they suck the soul out of your body. And it... Whenever I'm about to do something, I think, would an idiot do that? And if they would, I do not do that thing. Not enough for me. Just say it. Hit me again. The people that you work with are just, when you get down to it, your very best friends. I think that pretty much sums it up. I found it at Spencer Gifts. The Office had millions of fans during its run, with viewership slowly waning towards the end, but well after the finale ended, The Office picked up millions of new fans crossing national and generational lines, with the series being the most streamed series of 2020 by far. Well, don't look so surprised. But in all fairness, its move in the US to Peacock is probably the primary reason for that intense viewership in 2020. Regardless, The Office has an enormous fan base, with online communities on social media hitting astronomical numbers. And I'm just one of those people. I love this show. I think there's genius poured into every episode by everyone involved. I started out this series to call that out, that every episode, even if it's a filler, might be universally panned, might be deemed too cringy for consumption. Every episode of this, it fleshes out these characters a little bit more. And I can remember when the finale hit, I was sitting on my couch and feeling as though life was pulling me away from some friends that I had spent years of my life getting to know, laughing with, crying with, enjoying their company. It's one of my favorite things about The Office is that these people feel relatable even if they're going through crazy things or they do crazy things. I drove my car into a lake. So I don't tout to be the number one Office fan of all time. I don't pretend to know everything about the series. In fact, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna get a lot of stuff wrong along the way, and I don't really care. I doubt that's why you're watching this anyway. I'm here to talk about the series I love with people who also love it. So, hey, 
and welcome to The Office Field Guide. My name's Chris, and I'm reviewing every single episode of The Office ever, and today we're kicking everything off with the pilot. How are things going at the library? Oh, I told you, I couldn't close it, so. So you've come to the master for guidance? And I say kicking off, but really this is a rewatch field guide, meaning that I already reviewed this episode, but I'm coming back later to update it with my new format. I'll talk more about that at the end. The pilot has main writing credits attributed to Greg Daniels, a name I'm gonna talk about a lot throughout this series. Daniels is also joined in writing credits with Gervais and Merchant, and this episode was directed by Ken Quapis, who will have his hand in the show throughout the entire series. The pilot first aired on March 24th, 2005, was viewed by 11.2 million people, eager to see what the American adaption of the much-beloved British comedy would turn out like. The pilot has a well below average rating on IMDb of 7.5 out of 10. Okay, so in each episode, I have a series of comment contests. A trivia question, which for the pilot episode is, name Michael's primary influences in life. People I respect, heroes of mine would be. I'll also have an Easter egg in every episode. These will change from time to time. So for season one, why don't we go with Basketball Stanley? Boom, and it'll end up in next week's episode, which will be Diversity Day. So it's a contest. Answer the trivia first, spot out the Easter egg, and or leave the best emoji sequence summing up next week's episode, and you'll get your name in that field guide. And be warned, there's gonna be some spoilers for the series ahead. Okay, with that, let's get this one off the ground. I understand nothing. All right, in a modern world that's honestly full of office podcasts, reaction channels, books, blogs, and tons of other stuff, there's not a ton of stuff that's relatively unknown about the creation of The Office. So instead of me just spouting out things that we all know, let me point you to some great resources for that. It's like The Office Ladies podcast. It's done by Jenna Fisher and Angela Kinsey. It won last year's greatest podcast of all time or something. There's Brian Baumgartner's podcast that's an oral history of The Office. I think he's got another one that just came out or is coming out. Both those podcasts have an extremely high production value and their guests are amazing. I kind of have an ADD issue, so podcasts are a little difficult for me to get through. So if written word is more your thing, then I can recommend Andy Green's untold story of the greatest show of the 2000s or some crazy long title like that. It's great. I was actually last year able to interview Andy Green. Uh, he's an awesome writer. The book is really fun to read compared to what I thought it was gonna be. Out of all the common stuff I see about season one, there is an interesting topic that I do love reading about, listening to, and that's who almost got the parts of our favorite characters. And it's hard to imagine what the series would have been if any of these other actors were selected. So I just want to break it down for just a second. For the role of Dwight Schrute, uh, we had the likes of Seth Rogen, Patton Oswalt, Matt Besser, Matt Price, and Jarrett Grode. Up for the role against Rain Wilson, who did famously attempt to get on as Michael Scott. So there's less for the role of Pam Beasley, but most famously, Katherine Hahn tried out for the role. Trying to uh, remind my boss that there is no Y in paper. I wonder if that means that in a bizarro universe, Jenna Fisher's now in the MCU. Fisher was married to James Gunn at the time, so that could have been her in. Anyway, Jim Halpert, or Jim Nelson, as the original casting call stated, had actors like Paul Rudd, Steve Zahn, Zach Orth, Josh Radner, Ron Livingston, and Callan Hanks. And there's this great story of Krasinski waiting in the audition room, and he started speaking up about hoping that the network didn't screw up The Office as he loved the UK comedy, and didn't want to see just a cheap American knockoff, only to find out that the person he was talking to was Greg Daniels. But the longest to cast was Michael Scott. They really did like Bob Odenkirk, and we do get a glimpse of what that Michael Scott would have looked like real late in the series. But Gangnam Style's great, isn't it? Oh my God. He's Michael Scott. Also for consideration was David Koechner. A Packer Scott would have been really strange. But the casting memo had a buffet of different actors considered on some level for the role of Michael Scott. Each of these would have obviously changed the very fabric of the series itself, including people like Christopher Guest, John C. Riley, Eugene Levy, Cedric the Entertainer, Rick Moranis, Dan Aykroyd, Matthew Broderick, Owen Wilson, Jason Lee, Steve Buscemi, Stanley Tucci, John Favreau, William H. Macy, Gary Cole, Hank Azaria, Robert Townsend, Jeff Garland, Stephen Colbert, Dave Dave Foley, Mark McKinney, Richard Kine, Horatio Sands, Thomas Lennon, Dave Castanella, David Arquette, 
Andy Richter, Damon Jones, and Paul F. Tompkins, most of which they never really got past the discussion phase for. But they did have Louis C.K. come in and read for Michael Scott, and they even made offers to Paul Giamatti and Philip Seymour Hoffman. This was during the age where it was almost an impossibility to get a movie star to come down to television, as it was considered, and it was for the most part, a demotion of sorts. Today, that's not really a thing with these big budget, highly produced series in which these creators are no longer tied to that 90 to 120 minute runtime to tell their stories. They get to tell the stories they want, how they want to tell it, and the budgets and the creativity attract the stars. But getting Steve Carell on board with this television show when they did was kismet. He had just had a minor but memorable role in Bruce Almighty. He was on the rise in the community and NBC scooped him up at just the right time in his career. It's hard to imagine anyone else taking this role. And I'm sure you're gonna hear me gush about this a lot throughout the series, but Carell's character work is incredible, even in this episode. Have you felt the vibe yet? We work hard, we play hard. Sometimes we play hard when we should be working hard, <laughs> right? While we don't get much backstory on who Michael Scott is or what his motives are. I've uh, I've been at Dunder Mifflin for 12 years, the last four as regional manager. We could tell so much just by his body language. And these are all choices that Carell brings to this character. For example, look at Carell's eye work as he does this talking head. I think that pretty much sums it up. As he goes back and forth from the camera to the interviewer, almost as though he's seeking approval or validation for some wisdom or joke he dropped. Okay, all right. See you later. All right. Take care. Seeking approval is a characteristic of Michael that persists through the entire series. But there are some traits of Michael that are just unique to season one. And these differences are pretty evident on the surface. As Michael Scott, while not the only main character, is a spotlight and often the heart of the show. And this Michael that we get in season one is vastly different from the one that we see for the rest of the series. But I'm gonna get more into that when we get there in season two. But there are some difficulties watching season one for series veterans. And one thing is feeling that something is not quite right about the set. It's similar, but it's not the same as the rest of the series. Obviously, these establishing shots are different. This shot is famously from an actual office building in Scranton. But for the pilot and the rest of season one, they decided to film in a real office building. They didn't move to a soundstage until season two. While this decision does give the feeling of a drab office environment, it impacts a lot of things like the lighting, which can make this feel really uncomfortable. And obviously the personnel over the first season and rolling into season two have some unfamiliar faces for the series. The idea being that the doc crew would focus on a few of the staff members who would make for an interesting story subjects and the others would just be basic background characters like fan favorite Creed who fought to get himself on this show and his work really paid off. We're in the parking lot earlier, that's how I know you. So after The Office was picked up and they ordered an additional five episodes, the casting directors were able to actually spend more time on fleshing out the cast, many of which actually included writer's room participants. But we're gonna get more into that in Diversity Day. For now, let's dive into the deeper meaning. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kat. We're gonna get more into this in the ratings, but the pilot episode of The Office is just a rehash of the British pilot. She has left him, I forgot about that. <clears throat> that was a woman I was talking to. So going out on a limb, I'd suggest that the original series thesis is an attempt at commentary on the drab environments these business parts create, along with the bored humans that are forced to sit at their desk and waste their days away. Problems all compounded by having an incompetent and ineffectual boss. I've been promoted, so every cloud, now I love the way that the US office wraps their messages into the writing without having a normal, you see Timmy moment. You know son, some wild animals like squirrels and raccoons and rabbits can adjust to captivity, but a deer needs space. Often these deeper meanings run through both disconnected plot lines to reinforce that message. And the message is open to interpretation because they don't really have a PSA moment. I guess you're right dad. Well, Michael does sometimes. At least we put this matter to bed. That's what she said. Or he said. 
But the pilot, taking influence directly from the BBC hit, is merely a collection of loosely edited together footage from Ryan's first day. So I think what I'd rather do is share what I think the thesis is for the entire series, and that's going to give you a sense of how I watch this show. It comes down to how life has these moments of insanity, drama, arguments, joy, sadness. While we remember the highlights and the bad times, the stuff that happens in between, that's life. And The Office looks at how people who are connected by friendship or just by proximity can have a sincere impact on each other. And the pilot reinforces that message perfectly with just a day in the life of random people at a paper company. Okay, so with that, let's rate this thing. This is the worst. <laughs> okay, so rating Office episodes. Let me explain how I look at this. I love this series, I really do. But loving something doesn't mean that you think it's flawless. When it comes to an episode, I think that deserves a low score. I'm gonna call it out as such. When it comes to an episode that is nonstop genius in every layer of production, I'm gonna call that out as such. So what I've decided is that I'm not gonna rate this episode, the pilot. It's not really fair to rate this one. And that's not a cop out. I doubt that when NBC got the final tape of the pilot episode, they thought, this is the most genius thing I've ever seen in my life. I'm Hitler! Instead, they probably saw the potential of what they had, and while it wasn't lightning in a bottle yet, they probably thought just a few tweaks and it could be there. So I'm not gonna rate this episode as I compare all episodes of The Office against The Office as a whole, meaning that I grade on an office curve. If I give an episode a one out of five, that doesn't mean that episode is trash and I hate The Office. It just means that out of all The Office episodes, this one doesn't really measure. If I give an episode a five out of five, it doesn't mean that I think that's the greatest work of art that humans have ever created. It just means that it's one of the highlights of The Office for me. If I didn't rate on this curve, then everything would be like IMDb ratings, which has almost everything as an 8 point something, which is fine, but you don't really get to see the range if I rate everything a 4.392 out of 5, which leads to the problem with rating the pilot. It's so different from the rest of the series. The editing's weird, Michael's weird, everything is kind of stale, the lighting, the acting, the characterization's all off. And that's to be expected for a pilot. They were creating something just out of nothing. Just go along with it, okay? All right. And I appreciate that. The thing is, when they fleshed out the rest of the first season, they had a structured approach to each episode, and that became the formula of how every episode from then on would be created for the rest of the series. And that just doesn't exist for this episode. So let me hear in the comments what you think about the pilot. Maybe share your favorite episode of the series, or how you started watching the series. And as I promised at the very beginning of this episode, this is the second time I reviewed season one, and that's because my original content was a very different format. I didn't really know what I was doing. Creed was snoozing on the job most of the time. Quar quabity, quabity Ashwins. And I just felt like I needed to do season one justice. So I'm gonna roll these out once a week for the next little while. If you're new to the channel, hop on over to our Discord. There's lots of Office fans, there's fans of this channel. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.